My husband and I had to drive 17 hours last week to North Carolina for a wedding. It was an exhausting week and we basically spent the entire time rushing from one family gathering to another. We were staying in a motel for the time we were there. We had already been at this motel for a few days by the time the day of the actual wedding rolled around. The day of the wedding was hectic. We were rushing around trying to get ready to leave for the venue. My husband got ready before me so he could do some last minute things before we had to leave. That left me alone in our motel room to get ready before he returned. It was brutally hot outside and I decided to do my hair and makeup and just my underwear so I wouldn't be sweating in my nice dress the whole time. The way this motel was laid out, the sink and mirror were in the general open area of the room with the toilet and shower in another room. So anyone walking by our room window could see me standing at the mirror. However, I did have the curtains closed, but these curtains were a little bit sheer so you could technically see the shadow of someone walking by on the outside or could maybe see the silhouette of me inside the room. I was curling my hair in the mirror when I noticed the silhouette of a man walking by my room window. As he's passing by my window, I see him stop and start trying to look in my window. At first, I thought it was my husband trying to see if I was ready, so I paid no mind to it. But the longer the guy stood there, bobbing his head around trying to get a better look through the curtains, I began to realize it was not my husband, because obviously... Why wouldn't he just come in? Now I'm starting to get a little freaked out. Before I could do anything though, I watched as this guy starts to go from my room door. My utter shock and horror came when he actually was able to open the door and walk inside. Before my husband left, he forgot to pull the door shut all the way till it clicked into its lock. He was very upset at himself when I told him this later. So now I'm face to face with this man, and I'm in my underwear no less who's at least six foot tall and standing in my room. I thought to myself, this is it. He's going to attack you. That's a very scary realization to have. I also thought to myself, you're going to have to burn his eye sockets out with his curling iron if you want to survive. And for a few seconds, probably only a second or two, but it felt like a lot longer, he just stood there staring at me like I was a piece of meat and he was starving ready to pounce on me like prey. He then began to smile the most evil-looking toothy grin I'd ever seen and started mumbling under his breath. I couldn't make out what he was saying completely, but I did make out the words, pretty lady, and come here. I don't know if it was the fight-or-flight response, but I suddenly got angry and charged towards him, ready to strike him with my hot curling iron. I screamed as loud as I could, terrible obscenities. It must have startled him because he jumped back out onto the balcony of the motel. I saw this as my chance and I ran for the door. I luckily was able to get to the door and slam it shut right before he was able to make his second attempt at re-entering inside. I immediately collapsed on the floor, sobbing. I literally was too scared to move from that spot until my husband came back about 15 minutes later. I told him the whole thing and he was freaked out. He initially wanted to find the guy so he could beat him up, but I refused to let him leave my side. He must apologize a thousand times during the rest of our trip for not making sure that the door was locked before leaving, but I told him that the day and the whole trip really was so rushed I could see how it happened. We went to motel management and told them the whole story. The police were obviously called and I gave them a description of the guy so they could see if it was someone who was staying at the motel. After going around to the few motel occupants, they said no one matched his description and concluded he wasn't staying there. Obviously, we were late to the wedding that day, and the whole experience just ruined what should have been a happy time. We planned on staying another day before our long drive home, but we both just wanted out of there as soon as possible. We skipped most of the reception, went back to the motel, packed up, and left. I'm usually always so vigilant with locking my doors, especially when I'm home alone. Just goes to show you, all it takes is that one time you forget to check your locks, and that certain unwanted guest is inviting themselves in. I work second shift at my company, normally from 5pm to 1am. 
On the street I work, there are two ways for me to get home. To the left takes me over some train tracks. There is a 24-hour burger place and a Mexican fast food place that is open till 3 a.m. The police station is maybe a 10-minute drive from the tracks. To the right, it takes me straight to the highway, which gets me home. If I go to the left, I have to take side streets to get to the highway as it doesn't connect for a few blocks or go back over the tracks and past my workplace to get to the highway. Now onto the story. Tonight, I got out a bit early, around 12.30. Lucky me. I was hungry, so instead of going straight home, I decided to go for burgers. Usually, I have my window rolled down, listening to music on my phone. As I close my car door, I realize a rather large spider... Okay, it was the size of my thumb, but that's still a big spider to me. Has spun its web outside between my window and my side mirror. Spiders freak me out. If it had been inside, I would have beat Usain Bolt getting out of that car. Since it was outside, I contended to myself to leave my windows rolled up and just blast my music. As I'm pulling out, I see the train barriers come down. I'm not foolish enough to try and beat it, so I pull up and wait at the barrier. As I'm waiting, I see movement out of the corner of my eye, and that's when I see him. A haggard man, maybe somewhere in his thirties, with dirty hair and clothes standing next to my car. We have a few homeless people around, but they usually don't bother you if you ignore them and don't talk to them. I figured he'll go away. He walks to the driver's side and tries to open my car door. My car has automatic locks that activate pretty much as soon as you turn the car on, thank God. He then starts banging on my car door window. He keeps screaming for me to let him in. I reach for my phone, but of course I'm panicking and can't get it out of my purse, and then immediately dropped it down the side of the seat. I'm scared he's going to break the glass or something at this point. I have a foldable nightstick in my car, but in my panic I forgot it was there. I finally get a hold of the phone and dial 911. I'm screaming at him to back off and that I've called the police. He's going around trying to get in the car via the other doors, screaming at me the whole time, calling me about every name in the book, saying, Get out of the car. I'm giving the dispatcher my location, and it feels like forever for the cops to show up, but it was likely only a few minutes. The guy in the meantime is crawling on top of the car and beating it with his fists. Of course, now the train is left and the barrier is up, but I don't want to risk hurting this guy and making myself liable by flooring it over the tracks. Not sure about that, but not willing to risk any jail time over this crazy person. Thankfully, I see the cop lights coming. He runs off and one of the responding officers gives chase. The other cop tells me to pull in at the burger place and calms me down. He takes all the information I can remember in my panic state. He then says offhandedly something to the effect of, good thing your windows weren't down. That's when it hit me the only reason they weren't down was because of that spider on my car. They didn't find the guy as there were a ton of places to hide and it's pretty rough terrain at night, but they did say they would step up patrols around the area. The cops assured me I did everything right that I could have done, didn't get out of the car and called for help. I decided to skip eating as I wasn't in the mood anymore and just went home to have a freak out and methodically quadruple check all my doors and windows. Cops said they would call if they found anything, so we'll see. To the spider that may have inadvertently saved my life, I'll let you slide this time. I often like to go running in summer whenever the weather is nice. This happened a week before I was supposed to start high school. I thought about going running that day, but I got that idea in the morning and I run in the evening while the sun is still up, but it isn't as hot in the day and there isn't a chance for it to get hotter if I don't manage to get back in time like in the morning. Well, of course, I forget my promise to myself and only remember it at around 9 p.m., Now it's the end of summer, so the sun is already setting sooner than I'm used to, but I go, eh, I'll get back in like an hour or so, it'll be fine. I already have been putting off running, so I don't want to put it off again. I should probably mention that I'm a girl, and even though a lot of girls I know change the side of the road they walk on when they see even distinctly drunk-looking guys walking, 
I was always the one calling them idiots and was ready to take on the first rogue who tried to get to me. I also live in a less populated area out of the town where almost everyone knows everyone, so I was feeling extra sure of my safety. What a naive fool, I know. So I go out, I start my run and it's fine. It's getting a bit dark, but I can still see the running track, so all is good. I start to feel a bit off when I see a pair walking in front of me. When I get closer, they turn out to be just teen guys and I run past them with no problem. When I finally reach the usual point in my run, where I turn around, a cemetery. Ultra creepy, but it has benches and it's a small graveyard, so I never felt weird about taking a break there. It has already gotten pretty dark. I drink some water from my bottle and just stand under a tree next to the gate in the territory of the cemetery, but don't sit down where I usually do because the bench is next to a fence and the darkness has finally made me a little wary about being alone and someone jumping me. It's pretty funny that that's what scared me the most of the time. When I catch my breath, I stay for a few minutes just listening to the wind. I see a bike drive past the cemetery, taking the route I will take while running back. I leave my resting place, and it had gotten really dark. Dark enough that I could barely see two meters in front of me. I start slowly running back. After 15 meters or so, I start hearing voices. A couple more, and I can clearly hear someone talking. My thoughts immediately jump to the conclusion that there are at least two people in front of me if I'm hearing a conversation. Now I slow down even more until I get close enough to actually hear what's being said. Keep in mind it's completely dark and this road doesn't have street lights so I can't see anything. I get close enough to finally make out the words and my heart sinks at what I hear. I can't recall the exact words that were said but the general idea. The male voice said, I see this girl. I could just pull her in the bushes. There were two bushes lining one side of the running track. As I've said at first, my heart stops, but immediately after, I go into fight or flight mode. I can hear my heart beating in my ears, and I'm full of adrenaline, the bad kind. I know I can't just stop, or he will know I heard what he said, so I continue to walk, but thank God that the running track is separate from the road by a small grass field, so I go to the side of the road, making some distance between us. I keep looking at him. Keep in mind, I still don't know how many people are there, but I see a square of light, presumably a phone, and then I hear him jump on his bicycle and drive off. It turned out he was talking on the phone, but just because he was alone didn't mean I was less scared of him. I walk on the side of the road for a good few minutes until I'm sure he would be far away from me, and once I get back to the running track, I sprint home like crazy. All the way back, I was shaking with fear and looking at the bushes and the cars that passed me with delirium, squishing my water bottle in my hand, ready to smack anyone who came close to me. When I finally reached the first road lights, I felt like I had escaped death. I've worked night audit for a new Bampton in one of the safest areas near me for a little over two years now. It's got direct access to two main highways. I've had a fair share of creepy guests and weirdos, but most were easy check-ins and fixes, and they're on their way. However, last night changed everything up. As safe as my property is, we do have a shady $40 a night motels on either side of our building. There's been some stuff that's went down at both places, and occasionally their guests try to sneak into my hotel for a free breakfast. I have on two occasions seen the police raid both motels and spend all night searching for people who ran and collecting evidence, I presume. It's been a while since I've had such entertainment, though. It's about 2.30am and I'm getting ready to run my night audit. My doors are locked and this guy who is dirty but in a construction worker kind of way walks up. We have plenty of construction workers stay here as we aren't far from their site and we're rated number one in the area. So I open the door for him and ask if he needs a room before I run the audit. He grins at me, but it's anything but a warm welcome. It looks almost fake and almost threatening. He looks at me for a second and he says, 
I have a guest in room 144. His wording caught me off guard. Not many say they have a guest in a room. It's usually, I'm here for or I'm meeting. The second issue is, we don't have a room 144 and neither do any of the same brand names in my area. I've been to all of the immediate ones, so I inform him that we don't have a room 144. He looks at me for a second and says, Ah, oh, shucks. Guess I got stood up. Giggles and walks out the door. Thinking this is very odd, but whatever, I go back to running the audit. As I'm finishing up, the phone rings. A guy starts chuckling and says, There's a car in your parking lot with its lights on. Oh, and by the way, I'm the guy that just got stood up. Now one, it's been 30 minutes since he walked out my door. Why is he still in my parking lot? Two, nobody has come or gone since him and there are no lights on in the parking lot before he came in. And three, why do I need to know that you're the guy who got stood up? I brush it off as odd, but my gut is telling me something weird is going on. I wait about five minutes and then walk around the front of the building from the inside and see no cars in my parking lot with lights on. It's not very well lit, so it would be easy to spot. I'm back at the front desk, waiting for the audit to finish up its thing so I can get ready to start breakfast, and the phone rings again. I pick it up, and it's the creepy guy again telling me there are lights on in the parking lot. It's been at least another 20 minutes since the last call. So again, why would he still be in my parking lot? I feel I may have missed something between the windows. So I go to my locker door, peek my head out real quick to do a swift scan of the lot, and my eye catches someone standing in the corner of the parking lot. It's the creepy guy, and he's watching me. There's also no car with its light on. I run back inside, double check that the doors are locked, and I start to feel this sense of panic, and something really bad is about to happen flows over me. I have never felt this feeling while on my shift, and only once before in my life, and let's just say, I have physical scars from what happened that time. I get back to the front desk and I call the local police department. I explain the situation to dispatch and they ask if it's ever happened before. I tell them no, but also inform them that I'm the only employee on the property and I would like for them to scan the parking lot and check in with me if possible. The police department pulls up and wants to get a description from me before searching the area. Well, as he's getting out of the car, he notices movement. The creepy guy took off. The cop walks in a little nervous and tells me what he had just seen while using his radio to call for assistance. Three more show up and they discuss it. Search my parking lot and the two neighboring parking lots. They seem to come up with nothing but stick around to patrol the parking lot until the sun came up. The police department has stopped by once since my shift started tonight to check on me and said that they would be in the area if I needed anything. While here they tell me that... A total of three guys fled the parking lot from different directions last night. He believes that the creepy guy was trying to lure me into the parking lot away from the door so I would end up trapped between the three of them. He didn't go much further as to what could have happened from there and I honestly don't want to dwell on it. So just over 10 years ago, I was fresh out of college and had moved back to my parents' house for the free rent, food for nine months or so before I was leaving the state for graduate school. Now my parents are super chill and gave me my own space in the house, but being a 22-year-old single guy and living at a house in the sticks, they had just recently moved about 40 miles south of a major Midwest city, is certainly not ideal. But I didn't have any other options, so I started looking for some work to pass the time than to save up some money. Anyway, so summer turned to winter, and I still hadn't found anything solid. But by then, I desperately needed to spend more time out of my parents' house, so I took a part-time gig doing some light bookkeeping for a small business owner guy that my dad knew. I didn't really want to do it since it didn't pay much, was short-term, and wasn't even a real office setup, but again, since my parents lived in the middle of nowhere in the Midwest think acres and acres of farms. I knew I had limited local opportunities to make some cash, and this guy was going to pay me under the table as well. 
About that same time, a friend of mine in the city said that if I just paid him $200 a month and helped clean up, he'd basically let me crash in his living room until I was ready to move out of state. That was all I needed to hear. I took the job. So my dad's friend's family had a construction type business. They helped out with building stuff a little, but it was ultimately more focused on renting out a few bobcats and large augers they owned. Also other various drills and then odds and ends like generators and other low-level construction or farming equipment that someone in that area couldn't afford to purchase but needed to use from time to time. This was a small mom and pop type thing where everyone knew everyone and the office only opened on days when someone was coming by and was just generally a mutually beneficial situation for the business owners and the locals. Since I had minored in a business adjacent area and my dad recommended me, they trusted me to go in there for about 15 to 20 hours a week and check and file the rental forms, make sure nobody missed a payment date if there was a payment plan in place, answer an email or two, talking, discussing prices and availability, etc. I mean, it was really a super easy gig. The old building where I worked was about 90 years old and at the top of this little hill, and the downstairs used to be an old country bar until the 1970s when this family bought it cheap, cleared out the bar, and fenced in the property to use its parking lot area to store all their rental equipment and gear. I could generally come and go as I pleased, work any hours I wanted to as long as the work got done, so if things were slow and there weren't any rentals for a couple of days, I'd usually go in after 7 and stay until around midnight or 1 since... I knew I'd be alone and could listen to music loud and take my time and all that. The office where I worked was on the second floor of the building above the old bar and looked out onto the long driveway. From my seat I could easily see out the window and once or twice saw a family of deer or a raccoon scamper by and I always glanced out when I saw movement since it was very noticeable. It was incredibly remote, very still and quiet so if something unusual occurred or if something felt off, I definitely noticed it. One night during the winter, it had snowed a few inches and my dad told me to stay in because the roads were bad, but I had an old SUV and more than that just really wanted to get out of the house, so I went into work at around 8pm and was going to stay until just after 1. I always left the gate open at the bottom of the hill since believe me when I say that nobody ever showed up at night since we were literally in the middle of nowhere. I think the nearest occupied house is about two miles down the road, and to even turn onto our short road you had to only be coming to our specific building and probably know it was there beforehand. It was a locals only type thing and very small since the family had inherited a lot of money, we're pretty sure, and kind of did this rental thing on the side. Basically, someone would never just get lost and end up at our building. So I'm jamming away to some fallout boy everyone makes mistakes when they're young, and having some coffee and kept glancing at the snow outside here and there since our one orangish street light reflected onto the ground at the gate and was causing the light to shine off the snow in a really cool, dare I say pretty way. At one point around midnight I went downstairs to the big bathroom to do my bathroom business and then came back upstairs and got settled back into my work. I probably did about five minutes of work when I glanced outside and saw a huge imprint of something in the fresh snow just below the light. It seemed like it must have been a huge dog or a substantial animal had just rolled around on the ground there on its back or something. Since I didn't notice it just 15 minutes before, it had to have happened while I was in the bathroom or maybe when my back was turned, since I would have seen that type of movement for sure. I shook it off and assumed a dog or maybe a farm animal, this was common around this type of area, had gotten loose and maybe was attracted to the light or something, who knows. At around 2 in the morning I was leaving and as always got out of my car to lock the gate up. And to be honest I had pretty much forgotten about the imprint in the snow but when I looked down I was shocked to see that it wasn't just some disturbed snow but it was undeniably the imprint of a human made snow angel. If you don't know what a snow angel is, it's when kids lie on their back in the snow and push their arms and legs back and forth, so when they get up it looks like the outline of an angel. I used to do this when I was a kid, so I 100% knew for sure what this was, and it was deliberately made underneath the light post. 
but it wasn't from a kid. It was from a very large person, or at the very least, a normal-sized adult wearing tons of layers of big winter clothing. I looked up and saw what I already knew, that whoever had made this snow angel could easily look up and have seen me through that window, so they must have waited for me to head downstairs to make this angel. Now, I definitely would have seen or heard if someone drove up to our building, even if I was in the bathroom, so I knew someone had to have walked deep into the freezing cold and snow for a few miles, stopped in front of our building, and then did a snow angel in the small amount of time I wasn't sitting in front of my desk window. I glanced around for tracks in the snow and saw that there was one set that led to the nearby woods to the right of the building, so it was clear the person didn't use the road, but instead came from the opposite side, which made me instantly uneasy, since that side was just trees and darkness for miles and miles. I was definitely a little freaked out now once I realized that someone had just been this close to me secretly in the middle of the woods, and I looked around but didn't see anything amiss at all, and now just wanted to get out of there. When I got back in my car and drove a few feet, I realized that my boss would be there in like four hours and might see the snow angel and assume I did it since he probably assumed I kept the gate locked when I was there. It wouldn't have been that big of a deal, but I was young and felt like I might be made fun of by him if nothing else. They were all manly men. I like books. So I opened the gate back up really quick, ran over and kicked the snow around so as to hide the angel, locked it up again and went back to my car. Also, I should note that this is what really happened at this moment, but I almost lied here and said something else since it seems fake since I assumed the average person wouldn't get out of their SUV and not just flee in their car because they'd be embarrassed about a snow angel. But at that time I was insecure and cared a lot about what others thought, so unfortunately this is what I did. Also, I wasn't exactly fully terrified at this point even though it was certainly unsettling. I just thought it was really weird and could have been an illegal hunter even though hunting at night in the cold didn't make much sense. Either way, the imprint was made two hours earlier and I assumed that they were long gone. But that's when I heard it. When I was getting into my SUV, there was the loudest high-pitched laughing coming from the woods. It almost sounded like a fake laugh, the way the witch in The Wizard of Oz or something laughed. Like someone was doing it on purpose to show that they weren't scared of me or to see how I'd react all at once. I knew that they were laughing at me on our property. It was close enough that I knew they could probably see me, but I couldn't see them at all since other than the street light I was under there was no illumination. After a few seconds of laughing they stopped, and then it was just silence everywhere, except for my heart beating through my ears. Then the laughing started again, though louder this time, more like screaming and laughing combined. I sort of froze for just like five seconds listening in a panic. Now I spent a lot of time in that area and I know what coyotes and foxes sound like at night with their high pitched screeches during mating season so I can't completely logistically rule that out. But to me it honestly felt like it was an adult man trying to emulate a woman laughing. Like someone was deliberately trying to make a fake scary shriek laugh in order to scare someone. Well it worked. After that five seconds, I immediately filled with adrenaline, got in my car, and drove away from there as fast as I could without sliding off the road. Back at home, I was up all night trying to figure it out and told my parents the story when they woke up. After talking it out, we decided it was one of two things. It was either my brain somehow convinced itself the snow formation was angel-shaped when it was really just caused by some animal and then the snow tracks and laughing was just a coyote or red fox. Though, I don't think that's what it was. What I truly believe, the second thing, which is that some local was out walking around for some reason and decided to mess with me. I didn't have any close friends left in that area that would do this, and if they did, they would certainly have brought it up or make fun of me for speeding away in terror. I found out later that nearest house was... A super old couple, so I highly doubt that it was one of them, which means whomever it was went out into the woods in the night in the freezing cold just to mess with a stranger. I don't have any mental issues or family history of them, didn't do any drugs, I drank socially at the time but certainly didn't that night. I also don't believe in the paranormal so I never once gave that a thought. 
In my heart, I know someone was out there. I worked there another six weeks or so and never had a single issue, though I knew where my boss kept his gun and I always made sure it was there when I started my shift. I certainly always locked the gate from then on. Thinking about that experience that night, the part that freaked me out the most was that he had to have waited around for me to leave for about two hours just to do that laugh. He didn't know me. I could have been crazy and the type of person to get mad and try to find and attack him, yet he didn't seem scared or to care while he tried to mess with me. For some random dude, this is probably a story he tells from his point of view to make all of his friends giggle hysterically. But for me, that dude, the one I call Angel in the Snow Guy, the one with the laugh I'll never forget. Please, don't come back. My friend is from the UK, and she is an absolute doll. I love her to bits, but her parents are a little weird. Her father is a perv, always has been around me and other friends. We try and avoid going to the friend's house, but because she's located in the exact center of the city, we always end up meeting at her house before we go shopping, to the movies, or out to dinner. I'm 16, we'll be 17 in July, and they're all 17 to 18. I will not go into too much detail about the creepy things her father's done, but I can tell you that he has peeped into her room while I was changing into my swimsuit or my pajamas several times. Pervy Dad has always done a few things to our friends, but he has always stayed in the reasonable deniability zone, where if we accuse him of peeping or getting too close or being too inappropriate, he can easily make us feel like the crazy ones. We actually thought we were all overdramatic and paranoid until dinner one night in a restaurant months ago when the friend was not present and someone said, do you think friend's dad is a little weird? To which we all exclaimed, yes, I thought that was just me. This is common, men like this are despicable, they have a talent for picking on girls, manipulating them and taking advantage of them. Her mother was either completely oblivious to her husband's actions or thought that all men behave that way around attractive teen girls and that it was our fault for acting promiscuous. We are religious Jewish girls in Israel, we wear long skirts and uniforms to school, and we won't touch a light switch past 6pm on a Friday, but yeah, of course we're trying to seduce your husband. Yesterday, Thursday, I realized that it was the latter. Friend has a pool at her house and she invited me over to swim. I was hesitant, but she mentioned that her parents would be leaving soon and that we could blast music and hang out, so I packed a bag and rode my bike over to her house. When I arrived, her parents were still there. Apparently the appointment was rescheduled, so they decided to stay home for the evening. Pervy dad and crazy mom were watching TV on the couch and I thought that they wouldn't bother us. We were outside and before we get into the pool I put on sunscreen. I'm not wearing anything too crazy, just a plain pink bikini. Usually I'm a little self-conscious, but I've been going to the gym every day and getting fit so I felt really good about myself. But after what happened yesterday, not anymore. Pervy Dad comes out and while well, the friend is in the pool, he comes and sits next to me on the chair. He engages in light small talk and... I pray he's just here to chat. The conversation turns a little inappropriate, but again, if I said something, he would have said that I was acting paranoid. That was until he asked me to smile for him. And if you're a girl, you know the kind of anger that request invokes. I said, Excuse me? You're being very inappropriate. Please leave me alone. Very plainly, but firmly. He told me that I didn't have to be so rude about it that he just wished that I would smile more because I was looking a little depressed, that it was immature of me to come into his house and shout at him. I wasn't even shouting. Crazy Mom hears the noise and comes outside. She senses the tension, sees me in my bikini and immediately turns red in the face. Pervy Dad and Crazy Mom go inside and I continue lounging in the chair. A few minutes later, Crazy Mom comes outside with a few choice words to say. I was hoping she would apologize. If she had been calm and respectful, I would have covered up and apologized, but the universe was not kind to me on that day. 
If you're gonna sit there by my pool, dress promiscuously, and then act all innocent when men flirt with you, you can leave my house now. I was in shock. I have never had an adult speak to me so unkindly before, but I bit my tongue. She was my friend's mother, and I am not a troublemaker. I told her that I didn't mean any offense, but some of the things that Mr. Pervy Dad were saying to me made me uncomfortable and I politely but firmly asked him to leave me alone. She started screaming at me. I didn't get all of it because I was in such a daze, but it was something about how her husband was a good man and that I was all these terrible expletives for trying to get him to sleep with me, and that the only reason he was talking to me was because I looked depressed and he wanted to give me some company. I was ungrateful and I was rude and blah blah blah. She then raised her hand like she was going to slap me and I flinched. This somehow made her more angry. I was escorted out of the door. She grabbed me firmly by the arm, still in my bikini, clutching my bag, my phone, my keys, while my friend watched from the pool. And I haven't spoken to that friend since. Oh well. To the friend, I hope you can learn to realize that you don't have to behave the way your parents do. And you can rise above that. All of us are here supporting you and loving you when you're ready. When I was around 15, I had started babysitting a family with three kids, two boys, one girl. Their mom knew me as the oldest, was friends with my little brother, and asked my mom if I could help out just because she had started taking on more shifts and her husband was doing the same. They lived right next to my high school and paid well, so I agreed despite not really having that much experience. Pretty quickly I realized that it was going to be difficult. The kids were great, but I was nervous around them. The oldest was fine, just playing on his Xbox most of the time or doing homework, but the two youngest were a different story. The middle child, daughter, was completely obsessed with horror movies, and on more than one occasion I had to hide the knives from her since she wanted to reenact them, and the youngest son tried to set the Christmas tree on fire. I know what kids can be like since I have a lot of younger and older cousins, but these ones drove me insane, and I would constantly worry about them hurting themselves or each other. If they played up, I would threaten to call their mum, which normally would work. It was after a few months that I realized if I had mentioned their dad, that's when they would really just behave and do what I asked, so that's what I started doing. No, I never actually met the dad. I just knew that the guy was really tall and big and built, but was always described to me as still being really nice, so I never thought about it. On this occasion, I had said to the youngest boy that I would call his dad if he didn't stop behaving, which resulted in a huge tantrum so I ended up calling him and explaining. Luckily for me, the dad was getting off of work early, so he said that he would get home as quick as he could and apologize for the kid's behavior. When I had explained this, the kid was sobbing and ended up locking himself in his room. That day, the dad got home, and they weren't joking when they said he was tall. I'm only 5'3 and was 15. When I saw him having to crouch a little to get through the door because of his size, I remember thinking... No wonder the kids won't misbehave when he's there. I said hi and apologized for the work call, which she had brushed off and said that it needed to be done and not to worry. We were both sat on the couch. I can't really remember why, but I think we were talking about what days they needed me for. Now at this stage, the two youngest had went outside to play while I was in with the oldest, as I had just been tidying a little from dinner. I was pretty weirded out because his oldest started to get pretty antsy when asked to go to the shop, kept making excuses to his dad so I just offered to go. I could see the dad visibly frustrated and just wanted to defuse the situation. Now I would like to point out that everything seemed normal at this point but I remember feeling really intimidated by the dad. I only met him this one time and spoke for no more than 20 minutes. It turns out that the oldest had said to his mom that he didn't want me left alone with his dad as he had apparently been watching me a little too closely during our short encounter. The parents had asked me to babysit later on that week which I had agreed to, however in the space of a few days that quickly changed. I got a text from the mom apologizing for the last minute arrangements but saying I couldn't babysit. I was a little agitated since I had changed plans but 
wasn't too bothered and just said it was fine, and just let me know when she needs me. She had asked me to come round to get my pay for the last two weeks and I decided to just nip around before going home. As soon as I was in the house, I could tell something was off, but not wanting to pry, I just went in to say hi, talked about books for a little bit, and left. It wasn't until the next week, I think, or the week after where everything kicked off. I came home to my mom being upset and angry, pacing the living room while my stepdad was trying to calm her down. I immediately went to her, asking what was wrong, feeling a little worried. Instantly, she just threw her arms around me and started crying and holding me. I had meant to be babysitting, but again, got cancelled on, so I was home earlier than what I said I was originally. Pulling away confused, I asked her what was wrong again. Turns out my mom had been trying to get a hold of me, but my phone had died. I had went to babysit and nobody was home, so I just decided to head back on the bus, but wasn't able to let my mom know. She sits me down and starts trying to ask me questions about the dad and my time babysitting. Confused, I had mentioned that I had only met him once and only really spoke to him on the phone a handful of times when the kids were acting up. Nodding, my mom started pressing and asked if anything else had happened and kept questioning me, saying I could tell her anything. I just looked at her confused and told her that nothing had happened and asked what this was all about. I always remember her taking a deep breath and saying, Oh, thank God, before letting me know what happened. Now, as I said, the details are vague because this was on the news. It turns out, the guy had killed someone while working and had been taken in by the police. During the interrogation, it turns out that he admitted to beating his wife and there were speculations of assaults. There was also mention that one of his types were petite girls that had dark hair, pale which happened to match my description at the time, and my mom was terrified in case something had happened. I'm turning 23 this year, and it still gives me shivers. I remember feeling like I was going to throw up and had a sinking feeling in my stomach. My mom held me close crying because she had been worried sick all day and scared in case something had happened. Needless to say, I stopped babysitting for that family right then and there. I felt so awful for the wife as she was honestly one of the nicest women I'd ever met. About a week later, I got a text from her, and as it turns out, I had left some books so I said that I would come over and get them. When I saw her, my heart sank. She had obviously not slept and was putting on a brave face for the kids who weren't sure what was going on. We ended up sitting in the kitchen and I gave her a hug, just trying to comfort her. I had mentioned that if she needed help with the kids, since he was gone, I would try and help, but she immediately refuses, as it turned out, people had started attacking the house. She gave me my stuff paid for the wages with a little more added, I had completely forgot, and said she appreciated it but it would be better off if I just took a step back from the family as she didn't want me getting hurt for being associated with them. To this day I still think about them and it still scares me after thinking about what could have happened. I still talk to the younger kids who are a lot older and even help tutor her younger girl. I helped the oldest when he started high school because I noticed the kids bullying him for what his dad had done, which was awful, considering it wasn't the fault of the family. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located on Spotify, Apple, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.